Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Today is the first uh, session, so it's a bit of uh, of a start uh, for this uh, uh, hybrid mode. So uh, first of all, apologies for not being able to be in church because uh, again, my family needs me uh, at home, uh, so that's why. But I hope to be in church next week uh, for the second session. So today we're looking at the doctrine of the church. So the doctrine of the church. And uh, why? Because uh, we believe that right theology leads to right living. So if you have the right idea of God, you have the right understanding of, uh, of your faith, then uh, your, your living actually corresponds to that. So that is the, the premise, the basis that we go on now. So uh, today we're looking at ecclesiology, which is uh, just simply the theology of the church. Big word, but then if you need to read up on it, then at least you have a keyword over there. So it's just a study of the church. Huh? So this series is in classroom format. Uh, so it's a bit different from some of the sessions, especially done by uh, Brian or Fasalim or Peter or Zach, where you actually have uh, uh, interludes in between where you can actually have questions and engagement. Um, I'm trying to do this in a, in a seminary style classroom format. So a lecturer, which is my profession. And then, so I have the lesson first and then we have questions at the end. Now, so what that means is that if you have any questions, uh, I hope that you can uh, either write it down or put it in your mind and then uh, put it at the end. So we'll be collecting questions at the end, actually, even if we are not able to answer all of them. Oh, so just uh, help uh, keep that in mind. So all the questions will be at the end. So there's... Uh, the uh, For those who are interested, I'm actually following the uh, outline from, from this book, which is a very, very good book. I really enjoy reading this book, Sojourners and Strangers, The Doctrine of the Church by Greg R. Allison. So it is, uh, it's basically the whole book is about the, uh, this, uh, the doctrine of the church. So I'll be sharing from two chapters for this uh, next three sessions. So what I'll do is that after class, I'll send out via WhatsApp a chapter for optional reading. I say optional because it can be quite tricky reading uh, and not, all, not everybody has the same uh, interest as me. So uh, it is optional. So don't feel intimidated if uh, you don't like the chapter. Okay, so it's, there's nothing. All right, so don't, don't feel like uh, it is a... a I would say a mark of faith or a mark of abilities or anything like that. It's just some people like curry, some people like laksa, some people like durian, some people don't. All right, so don't worry too much about that. And then uh, there are other types of books. So in, in this uh, ecclesiology, which by the way, is uh, one of my favorite doctrines. If there is a favorite doctrine, uh, the, uh, the study of the church is something that I really uh, like to read about. So you have the church is uh, by Edmund Clowney. That is a classic. It is often used uh, by seminarians. Uh, you have nine marks, a very popular one. It's uh, easy to read. Okay. So, and then uh, it's part of a greater collection, the nine marks uh, collection. Then you also have the local church, what it is and why it matters by Edward Clink, uh, the third. Uh, so it's also easy to read. So the last two books are a bit easier. Uh, but the first two is a bit harder. Harder in the sense that it actually goes through a lot of the, it's kind of like driving a car. So you can drive a car, you can drive automatic. You don't have to think anything about how the car works. Whereas uh, some, but if you really want to know how the engine and everything works, then uh, you read the, the first two books uh, a, a bit more uh, in depth. So um, there are two ways to study uh, this, uh, the, the idea, the doctrine of the church. Okay, so one is uh, functional. Uh, and the other one is ontological big words. Uh, and I'll just explain them in a bit. Huh? And then uh, functional says that we seek to define and discuss the church. Again, we are talking about what is the church. The doctrine of the church, we begin with what is the church. So functional says that uh, we try to define, we try to define what is the church based on its activities, roles, or ministries. So for example, uh, I didn't know this until I read this book, but you can put the seeker sensitive, okay? So that's this activity, the role or ministry. Seeker sensitive is something that some of us uh, have heard. Uh, purpose driven from the purpose driven life sort of thing. So that's another model. You also have a small group model, again, a very popular model where it says that, okay, the church is uh, based on the cell groups or the small groups and then so on. That is the, that is the church. If we talk about what, what is the church? That is the church. And then they seek to um, orient the entire church uh, movement or, or the organization around this, this approach, this model. So th that is a functional model. And uh, I think that one is, uh, uh, is easier to understand, uh, definitely. And it's very easy to, to, uh, to share and people to follow and uh, try to copy. Ontological is not as easy to, to explain, but uh, I think 
for this series. Huh? Uh, I think this is the way we talk, we talk about it. Ontological talks about uh, define and discuss the church in terms of its attributes or characteristics. Okay, so let me just quickly just go explain what it is. One example of it is I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That's from the Apostles' Creed. So you could actually study it and say, what does one mean? What does holy mean? What does Catholic mean? And what does apostolic church? Uh, we're not even talking about uh, purpose-driven, seeker-sensitive, whatever it is. We're just saying, what is the church? Um, another way to think about it, another way to think about it is, if I ask you, what is man? Okay, what is man? And then you can tell me that man is one who can see, talk, walk, think, feel, breathe, love, worship, and so on. So you can, so you can tell me that that is what a, a, a human is. Okay, you can say, oh, this is what a human is, by what he does. Um, they, then I would put to you that there is a problem. The problem is that what happens when a man can't talk, when a man can't walk, when a man can't love, okay, when a human being can't do all, all these things? Is the person still a human? So we can think about this as a conception. So when, uh, when a life is conceived in the womb, is it human? Even though he does not demonstrate any of these things, even breathing is still breathing through the mom. Actually, there's no lungs that's developed. So, what is human? You understand? And then, when you come to end of life, if you're bedridden and you can't do anything anymore, you're like just, you know, coma, comatose. You can't do any of these things. It's where you can't breathe by yourself. You need a machine to breathe for you. Are you still human? So if you take a functional model on a human being, right, it is very dependent on your ability to function, which I think is, um, it's part of it, but it cannot be the main part, you see. So that is why uh, I think that ontological is better. Ontological, one way of thinking about it is a man is made in the image of God. Men are made in the image of God. So if we think about it that way, then we say that, well, um, a, a conception at conception is still made in the image of God. And then when you are dying, you're comatose or bedridden, or whatever it is, you are still treasured, cherished, valued, despite the person often sadly thinking that he or she is useless, but you are still valued in the eyes of God because you are made in the image of God. So I think it's much healthier and I think more accurate to look into the question of what is a church based on um, that view first. So this is a quote from a, a different book. It says that the basic identity, okay, what we're proposing here, the basic identity is to, of the church is to be found not in what it does, but in what it is, right? So that is the contrast between the two approaches. But you see later on that what it does is still part of the church, but our starting point, our starting point is what it is. And with that, let us pray. <laughs> okay, so uh, come, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, O oh God, for this time that we as a church can gather. And Lord, we pray that you can help us to glorify God, to be focused on Christ and his word, and to, to be... Uh, to be to remember that we are created, gathered, gifted, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, so that we know the origin of the church, that it is not men who build a church, it is God who builds his church. So there is, so we must be corrected in this. So, Lord, we pray that you help us so that we can move as one body with the same understanding of what is the church. And if there is any area that we do not agree with one another or agree with me today, then Lord, we pray that you yourself, you, O oh God, will show us the way. Thank you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, then. So let us uh, move forward. Um, today, we're looking at the origin and orientation of the church. So big words, please uh, again, understand whenever I use big words, it's not because I want to show off. It's not like that. It's just that, uh, again, words have, uh, have meaning. Uh, and if you want to do a keyword search, then perhaps these style of things can actually help you. Anyway, these words are coming from the, from the book I suggested. It's an outline. I'm following the outline, but I'm not following the exact 
the content of the book. I'm just using the outline. So doxological, it means the oriented to the glory of God. So just understand the words in the brackets. Lah. So one, the first one is about God. Second one is about the word, which is the word made flesh. So that's Christ. And then third is about the Holy Spirit. Okay, God, uh, uh, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's very Trinitarian. Huh? So I think uh, for all of us over here, we should not have a problem with that. Huh? So that the church it must rest on the Trinity. Uh, so that's why I say that uh, for this first session, it is uh, I, I won't be going through uh, these things like it, because this is not new believers class. All of us, as I see, we are actually uh, every Sunday for many years, we already know that we are supposed to glorify God. We're supposed to be Christ-centered. We are supposed to be all these things about the Holy Spirit. We already know. So I don't think we need to go through that. Um, tonight's session will be a test on whether our walk as a church matches our talk. All right. So again, right theology leads to right living. So uh, let us go through it and then let's see. Again, if you have any questions, if you disagree with me, that's also fine. Uh, but as we go through, again, we, let, we try to uh, build the church together. Lah. Um, so the first one is doxological. Okay, So we are saying that the church, the orientation of the church is oriented to the glory of God. Now, there are so many texts on the glory of God. I, I, in fact, um, it, uh, I didn't put any because I want to tell you uh, a story. So we, we use this one just to highlight an example where um, we all may say that we glorify God, but in our action, we may show less than that. Huh? Okay, so that's what I'm saying. So let's imagine this scenario, okay? You have a father's birthday party, and then his uh, children come and celebrate the party, the birthday with the father. Okay, they bought a cake and they're singing songs. Uh, happy birthday to you. Now, here's a problem. Uh, one of the siblings or one of the children say that I want to sing the song in this way. Uh, let's say just for the sake of simplicity, I'm to sing it in Mandarin. And the other child says, no, you want to sing it in English. Or you can put it in different tempo. We want to play the drum. One of says want to use uh, only uh, vocals, uh, a cappella. So anyway, there is basically a conflict. So the, the children want to do it. They are arguing. They are pulling hairs. They are hitting, pinching. They are making a very big fuss because they want to celebrate the father's birthday, whom they love, in their way. So obviously, they get very, very angry. Lah. Oh, I want it this way. I want it that way. So they both get very angry, very grouchy. So they are ruining the mood. And uh, so sometimes people would then give in. But uh, sometimes when people give in, they give in reluctantly. So they become unhappy. So now here's the thing, you see. If you can imagine the father, right? Um, when the kids are arguing <laughs> for a birthday party, I think all of us can understand if the father then suddenly becomes a bit um, ill-tempered and short-tempered also, because it's supposed to be a happy occasion, yes? <laughs> it's supposed to be a happy occasion, and then I'm supposed to be happy, and then you people are quarreling, so what is going on here? And then even if we have a giveaway situation, a compromise, whatever it is. But if one of the child is sulking over there and is very unhappy, very unwilling, very reluctant, and uh, even the father is not going to be happy, you understand? So the father over here, um, what does the father want? And then we come back to what is a birthday party? I mean, why are you having a birthday party for? The reason why you're having a birthday party is because you want to celebrate. That's the whole point, isn't it? Now, when you're celebrating, it's because you want to be happy. And who is the main person that you want to be happy? You want the father to be happy because he is the birthday boy. Yes? I mean, the point here is not for the child. It's not for the daughter or the son that the child is happy or the daughter is happy. Obviously, we want everybody to be happy. But the key here is that you want to please the father. So how can you please the father when you have a beautiful cake, when you have a beautiful song, when you have beautiful decorations and beautiful presents, but the children are fighting? No father would be happy. 
So the point here is to make the father happy. So that's the point about the church. What is a church? The church actually is a people oriented to glorify God. So we can have many, many wonderful things, but then uh, great songs, great this, great that, great this. But at the same time, if you are a people who are not putting God first in terms of glorifying God, and the Bible is full of ways on how we are to glorify God, one of them is to obey his commandments, then how can we be pleasing God? So we can see in this case that uh, one example is simply music. So I already uh, shared this, I believe, with uh, the main church and also the youth, is that uh, if the old people want to sing their old songs, the young people want to sing their young songs, okay, I've given this example, um, we need to be in a way that everybody is focused on God and be able to be happy praising God. If uh, the English service wants to sing the English songs, the Chinese service wants to sing the Chinese songs during a combined service, we need to find a way where both are able to rejoice. And that can only work, I believe, if you remember, this is where right theology leads to right living. If you remember the whole point of us coming together is actually to glorify God, then the differences in all these things can actually be worked out. Not to say it's easy to work out, but if you understand the purpose, if God is not pleased by bickering, then it doesn't matter whether the English sing English or the young sing young or the old sing old, because God is not honored when the people are bickering. So that is an example uh, of uh, if we know that we were both trying to please God, and again, we have both parties, then we both really work hard to please God by, what did Jesus say? Love one another. Huh? So that is an example. And to bring it closer to home, COVID-19. <laughs> the church also has, uh, has tensions. Yeah, I would use that word. Uh, and it's not just Piazza Baptist Church. There are many churches around the world who are struggling with, uh, throughout the whole process, uh, lockdown, no lockdown, SOP, no SOP, mask, no mask, the whole thing, like, every decision has actually somehow another cause tensions but again we remember that's why i say right theology will lead to right living even if we all lock down or not lock down or mask or no mask the key point over here is that are we glorifying god through our decisions because you can still make the right decisions and still displease god why because we do it in the wrong way we uh pull down the other brother or sister, we insult his or her intelligence, we, we impose motives on the other person, which is unfair, saying that the person only wants to do this because of something, something. Uh, so we impute motive where there is none. And even if you make the right decision, but God is not honored. So again, uh, we, we want to work at it such that uh, we are people oriented to glorify God. So that is what the church is. And I think that, uh, uh, again, we can do a hard check. And if we can do this right, it doesn't matter what decisions we make because we are glorifying God huh, to all. And every tension or every problem actually can be viewed as an opportunity to glorify God. Every tension, and I'm not saying this is easy. It's not easy for me. Um, but I think that that is, if we can just remember la, as a church, we come as a body, because churches always quarrel, because we have different people, all sinners, uh, trying to be uh, saints. So if we remember we are glorifying God, it will work. So that is the first part. And uh, I didn't share any scripture text because I think glorifying God is part of the DNA of almost every Bible verse. Now, so you can just take your pick from there. Logocentric. The, the book actually focuses on two parts, which is uh, Christ, the Word made flesh, and also the, the Word, the Bible itself. But uh, today I'll just focus on the Word made flesh, which is Jesus. Now, uh, recently I saw a cooking show, a cooking show, and then uh, the bakering, uh, bakering, baking, baking show, and then uh, they make cakes. So very nice, beautiful, beautiful cakes. And uh, so, the judge actually was eating all the cakes and then he, uh, the judge actually asked this question. Is, is this a pear cake? Because that's what the, you know, the contestant bring, uh, I'm making a pear cake with uh, whatever icing, whatever, chocolate garnish, whatever, blah, 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 so, so stuff, very fancy words. And then the judge says, 
is this a pancake? And then the person says, yes, it is. And then the judge says that I can't taste the pear in the cake. And then I think for all viewers everywhere, we understand there's something wrong already because uh, the other flavors overpowered the cake. So you understand, huh? so you got the chocolate, the strawberry, whatever it is. The... So they, they use all these uh, things and they say, I cannot taste the pear. And I think that there is a danger in the church as we run through the programs, as we go through even different doctrines and so on. There is a risk that we can't taste Christ. Can the world or even Christians taste the Christ, okay? Taste Christ in the church, the aroma of Christ, the, the presence, the light of Christ in the church. Uh, because there is a real danger of losing focus. Uh, there are many churches uh, who, who are very easily lose focus. Uh, a, a, a easy, an easy example, not to say it's the only example, uh, an easy example is uh, uh, Holy Spirit gives them. So the Pentecostals, uh, again, I'm not saying all of them, but I'm just saying that it can be something that drives the entire church until it becomes a priority. And uh, my argument is that uh, the Holy Spirit becomes a priority rather than um, rightfully it would be Christ, especially not the gifts of the Holy Spirit. No? That one, I think we understand. That's an easy example. But there are other, other examples. We are... Uh, we can sing Jesus is the center. We can sing that we will live by the word. Okay, We can sing all those things. But sometimes we may forget, actually. For example, how do we answer this question? But the cross is in the past. I mean, the, what, what did Jesus do? All right? So if an unbeliever comes, and, or, or a Christian, young Christian comes and says, why, why do you worship Jesus? Because of what Jesus did for me. Okay, So what did Jesus do for you? Jesus died for me on the cross, and then now my sins are forgiven, and uh, now I, uh, I have eternal life, and I can go to heaven. Great. Fantastic. So that was in the past, right? Yes. So do you still need Jesus now? I don't understand the question. So let's say you were in the fire of uh, damnation and sin and death and hell and all that. Okay. So then Jesus uh, basically saved you, and now you are safe. So if you're already saved, why do you still need Jesus? Because there is this thing that we have, and I think it's something that many Christians are in danger of, where they think that Jesus, what Jesus did was only in the past. So I remember only what Jesus did in the past. So the concept of that I need Jesus now, I need Jesus every day, I need it every hour, may not consider why I still need Jesus. And this is important because if you, if you need Jesus every hour, or you, you need Jesus, you really still need Jesus. But the question is why you still need Jesus? Because Jesus really done his work on you already. You need the Holy Spirit. No, 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 that's not true. You need Jesus every hour, but why? And uh, the answer here uh, is actually because of texts like this. Uh, Romans 8, 33 to 35, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate? I mean, this is the part of the love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, or tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or so forth? The key point I'm here wanting to make is, is interceding. It is a present reality. It is something that Christ continues to do. You may not be convinced as to put another verse. So in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So he always lives to make intercession for them. So we need Jesus now we still need Jesus every time, and if you are uh, you if you're familiar if you are aware of this, then the sermon itself is a is a reminder, and it is and the worship songs is not talking about a past experience where you're thankful for, it is a continuous thing that you are thankful for. Okay, so that is. Uh, uh, why we need Jesus uh, every day. Now, how does this change the way we live? Uh, let, me, uh, let me just explain. 
if if we take this example, okay, of uh, you and the fire, then the helicopter left. Okay, so in the heli fire, helicopter save you. Okay, so there's the rope over there. Okay, so there's the rope save you. And then now you land over here. Now my question over here is that are you now in heaven? If the if we say that the green plot, okay, so if we just use this uh, picture, uh, if we say that the green plot over here, okay, away from the fire, uh, is heaven. Are you currently wherever you are? In heaven the answer is no you're not in heaven so if we are using this picture then where are you isn't it you're not in heaven you okay so that means you are still hanging on to the rope or oh. and that fire is an ever-present danger but it is something that you're very aware of and it's something that you are so thankful that there is that rope that is the helicopter is holding on to you, isn't it? And therefore, the life of a Christian is saying, oh, thank you so much, because there is this fire all around me. And then like this thing, that is, the only thing that is keeping me safe is actually Jesus. And then you're always thankful. And you'll say that in Jesus' name. And then I sing songs. And this is a beautiful song. In fact, this helicopter illustration, I, I thought about it because of this song. When I fear my, my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. He must, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. I love this music, uh, this song, the other verses as well, but uh, the, the, the thinking, the theology over here is that it is Christ who holds you. And because of that, he's interceding for you. He's interceding for you, you and me. And therefore, the sermon, the teaching, the life we live, the church, the focus, everything, is not so much pursuing uh, all the various things of the Christian life, which is good, uh, okay? But we must always keep Christ center, not just because of what he did, which is we wonderfully preach it, love it, okay? But also what he continues to do and what he will do, again, he will bring us to heaven. Huh? He has prepared rooms for us. Okay, so that is the, the whole Christ picture. Again, let me remind everybody, which doesn't need reminding. The Muslims and the Jews actually have got the Father it's an, as a concept, if not a correct idea. If you talk about Holy Spirit, the various uh, other religions also have some sort of mystical idea. Even Star Wars have the Force. So in terms of God the Father and the Holy Spirit, there are various alternatives around. But only Christians have Jesus. If we lose Jesus, right, we lose our faith. And only Christians know the true Jesus. In fact, that's the way we check heresy. Jehovah Witness, Mormons, and so on, they have a perverted, distorted view of Jesus. So we must hold Jesus center in our devotion, in our adoration. Also remember, I just love this topic. When Jesus uh, spoke to Peter after his resurrection, uh, Jesus asked, do you love me? He didn't say, do you love the Father? Do you love me, Simon Peter? Yes, I do. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Why is Jesus so egocentric? Always talking about himself. Because that is actually the, 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 the way the Christian life is supposed to be. I love you, Jesus. Uh, so I think that is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I hope that that it will encourage again the, 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 the church to see Christ. So can the world taste the Christ in the church? Can the world taste Jesus in the church? Is our when we hear a sermon, when we teach, when we when we pray, when we when we sing, when we wait, all these things, uh, do we talk about Jesus? Uh, so that is uh, one thing. So what is a church? A church is a people focused on the word. The word made flesh. Word. Okay. So then the last thing. Okay. Hopefully I'm not going too fast. Uh, it's a bit hard for me to gauge because you guys are all now little small boxes in the thing. Um, but uh, if I'm going too fast, uh, maybe you can uh, stop me and so on. Hmm? But the last thing, uh, last, last, uh, the third point, which is the pneuma dynamic. dynamic uh, but ignore the big word. Uh, it basically just means a created, gathered, gifted, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Again, we're talking about origin and orientation of the church. 
Um, so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, um, the normal, the old controversy, I think it's no longer a controversy right now, but then uh, it sometimes pop up once in a while. But let's go through the easy one first. Now. But I don't think this is a problem with PVC. But this is something that uh, comes out often, especially for new believers, because it's the gifts of the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? And uh, I think the in this very short two minutes, three minutes, uh, basically just go through the most important passage with regards to the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit is found in 1 Corinthians. So um, uh, I'll just highlight the ones. Lah. So to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So it's for the good of, in this case, we read later on, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. And some prophets. The key word over here is so that the church may be built up. Now, for the common good, the church may be built up. I'll give you another one. So with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. So you can see over here that when it comes to... Because there's no really better, I mean, there are a bunch of other uh, passages on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but then 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14 is probably the main text for anybody talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you can see over here, it is not Terence Stan saying that the gifts of the Holy Spirit is primarily for building up the church. If you just read the text for yourself, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, you just do a study, just look at it, you will see that the gifts of the Holy Spirit is, is repeatedly stated to build up the church which means that it is the Holy Spirit's work is for the corporate nature, for the church. You understand? Because sometimes we can be very individualistic. So you can see over here that the gifts of the Holy Spirit is meant for the church. So you, uh, this is how important is the church in the, in the Bible, in the, in, the, in the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Huh? So I think it's very clear over there. So that one, I think, uh, we can talk about it, but then I think that the, the more uh, int uh, more serious one is the created and gathered, uh, created and gathered, which is what I want to talk about with a bit more that one. Um, again, First Corinthians 4, because it talks about the Holy Spirit. Uh, it says over here that for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So this is, again, what the Holy Spirit does is that it creates the church, it gathers the church, okay? That's what the work of the Holy Spirit does. Now, there are a couple of things over here. The word baptize is actually, um, we were all baptized, meaning that we were the uh, being acted upon. So the question is, who did the baptizing? No answer over here, okay? For in one spirit, so we were baptized into, okay? The, the spirit, but who did that work? Huh? Who did that work? And the answer will come up shortly. And all were made to drink. So notice the word, the, the, the Greek actually shows this one clear, clearer. It did not say that we drank the spirit. It says that we were made to drink. So we were acted on. Baptism was acted on us. Drinking of the one spirit is acted on us. So someone got us baptized. Someone got us to drink. Okay, so that is uh, one text. Then, uh, uh, yes. Um, can we repeat a bit on the from the baptized? I am baptized. So we lost. We lost the sound just now. Okay, okay, okay. Can can teething problems? Teething problems. Can so um now so. <laughs> Alright, can you hear me? Uh, just do a sound check. Uh, can you guys in the hall hear me? Hello? Hello? Testing, testing. You can hear me? Can, huh? Okay, fantastic. All right. Now, when you guys do a thumbs up, huh? you look very tiny in mind. So, uh, anyway, so let's carry on. So, baptize, what I was saying is that if you look at the Greek, right, it's uh, things that's acted on you. So, it didn't say, so it's, uh, so someone baptized us, but that someone is not stated. It's a passive, okay? It's a passive uh, verb if you still remember your English grammar. So, someone baptized us. And then we were made to drink. It didn't say that we drank. Okay, the way the, the Greek and even the English are structured is that we were made to drink. It's a very awkward phrase. Okay, it's very awkward because someone made us drink. Okay, so who is that someone? So then we look. Okay, so we carry on. 
and then uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, but as it is, okay, this, this whole text, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, I uh, got lots of stuff inside actually, okay, but I'm just picking off this to me, but you read it yourself, okay, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose, so God arranged the members, it is God who did it, and as he chose, okay, so again, we, let's look at it, uh, next one, but God has so composed the body. So who composed the body? It is God giving honor to the part that lacked it. So you can see over here, the baptism, the drinking of the spirit, the arranging and the composing uh, is actually all done by God. So who makes the church? It is God, even though uh, oftentimes we think that we are the one who decides who are in the church and who is not, which in a way it's kind of true but we are only instruments of God's will, okay? So who makes the church? It is God. Who chooses people to join the church? It is God. Again, looking at this text, it is we are merely acknowledging what God has done to the individual and welcoming the person to come into the family of God, which God did. <laughs> when Pastor Lim baptizes a person, it's not because the person applied for Mway, filled in a form and decided and so on, and then people decide to join and then he's part of the Mway group. No, there is a work of God in the person first. Okay? And therefore, it is God who, who makes the church. This is a very important point because uh, oftentimes you think that it is a, a human uh, means that we decide membership, which is true to a certain extent. Like I say, it is simply acknowledging something that has already existed. The same thing as baptism. God has already baptized them in the Holy Spirit before we go into the water, or at least that's the way it should be done. In the same way, God has already put these people as members of God's body, but it is now membership into the local church. Important, why? Because it talks about how do we treat visitors. Because if we treat visitors as people that God sends to the church, thus our responsibility is to what? Is to welcome them and to, I mean, well, however, because if you think about it as God sent, you know, like when I go to a, a place, a new place or wherever it is, and then, uh, uh, and then if I know some, uh, someone, uh, how, let me see how it's like a, uh, if I go to Penang, okay, like I go to Penang, what Pastor Lim did for me last time was uh, he's going to say, okay, can you, uh, Jeffrey O, oh, can uh, go and meet up with Jeffrey O, oh, he'll take you out for lunch and then you can just have a chat with him. And then just, just connecting people. Like, oh. So Jeffrey O oh basically just uh, took me out for a beautiful uh, lunch and then uh, had, a, had a very good chat with him. So I was very blessed by just talking to the man. Uh. So in the same way, uh, when God sends someone to you, to the church, you have to treat that person well. And if God has converted, did a regeneration work into the person, he is a member of God's family, whether you recognize him or not. But because he is your brother or sister, you need to welcome him. <laughs> Isn't it? So God sends, okay? Hope you understand this one. If God sends the person to Piazza Baptist Church, it is the responsibility of Piazza Baptist Church to represent, to do, how do I say, to do God's will. And then it comes to things like this. How do we treat ex-gangsters, ex-drug addicts, ex-protestutes, or poor people, rich people, uh, whatever it is, like also whatever people that is not like us? Because Certainly, some of us at this stage would say that that is not who we are. And I think that response is natural. And we can have a long debate about who we are and so on. But I suggest that if we look at the text and we say that the question we should ask is that, God, what do you want us to do? And I think welcome is a, a very standard thing to do here because it is God. Who, if we believe this, lah, it is God who send them our way. So, for example, lah, let's say we, we are as a church, we come and pray. God, God, we want to be a church that welcomes people. We want to be a church that loves children. We want to be a church that welcomes sinners. God, we love all these people. God, we want them, oh God. Then God say, okay, I'll send you Iban children. 
I'll send you drug addicts. I'll send you uh, people from Vietnam, from uh, Korea, from uh, uh, homeless people. They said, no, 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 I don't want them. <laughs> I, I want people who look like me, who think like me, who come from the same place as me. God, I want people like that. God will say what? In that case, uh, Jesus, we are only safe people who look like Jesus and think like Jesus and behave like Jesus. Why do I need to save people like you? Uh, again, historically, uh, Piazza Baptist Church also was known as a shell church, Caucasian, uh, many, many Caucasians. That has changed. Imagine if a Caucasian church say that we don't want the Chinese, the Indians, and the Malays, or the whoever it is to come in because we are a Caucasian church. I think uh, it'd be heartbreaking, actually. Hmm? So in that sense, uh, the purpose over here, again, is to invigorate uh, the church. A discussion on the doctrine of the church can actually help. Okay? The purpose over here is not to, to blame. That's not the purpose. And, and uh, it is to invigorate the discussion that the doctrine of the church can actually help us unite. It can actually help us move forward. All right, so that is the purpose of the doctrine of the church. It is what God has given to the church. It is not what parents is saying. I really hope you don't think, think of it this way. I'm just simply trying to apply uh, what I read over here after some thought and then applying it to the church context as Piazza Baptist Church, which, by the way, is something that only within the church we can do. Only the local church can talk like the way I talk. Because if you bring John Piper in, you bring a John MacArthur in, you bring any further fancy people, Edmund Chan, whatever it is, they don't know the Piazza Baptist Church context. You need to tell them. And even then, they may miss the mark. Only within the family, we can figure out the problem because we have been living in it. Okay? So again, we hear the doctrine. We see, we see this, uh, the, this beautiful text. We talk about glorifying God. We talk about Christ-centered. We talk about uh, uh, Holy Spirit is the one that create and gather and gift and empower. All these things are beautiful things, and that should invigorate uh, the, our, our beloved church over here. All right? Unite us in this doctrine. When it comes to, uh, again, if I step on too many toes tonight, uh, uh, please forgive me. That is not the purpose. Uh. So is the work of the Holy Spirit in the church like a washing machine? I'm trying to think of an illustration. And I think, imagine this, uh, imagine this, okay? You throw your laundry into the washing machine. I think maybe because my children, it's kind of like doing that to me. So you throw your laundry into the washing machine and then you start the washing machine. And then you put a detergent or whatever, everything inside. Already. And then halfway through the cycle, isn't it? Then your children say, oh, papa, papa, or oh, mama, mama. Uh, I still got my jeans, a very dirty one. Ayo, why are you like that one? Uh? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. I just open up and so on and so on. And then halfway through, and then somebody go and throw, and then somebody throw, and then now you have to put more detergent and so on. And uh, yeah, what are you doing? And then someone says, oh, I got lots of spill. Oh, that's going to dirty the whole clothes because it's a, a colored clothes. And then you're now very stressed about the whole thing. And you're saying that, why are you messing up my beautiful church? <laughs> because... We, we want to keep it clean. The, the clothes are ready, ready. You just wait for one more cycle, then the clothes come out, they're all clean. I can put them on the drying clothes. And then now it, keep, it never ends. The, 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 the work of the washing, the washing machine never ends. I can never put them out to dry. So that's the frustration. I'm trying to convey the frustration that we may feel when we, uh, again, deal with the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? We bring people in, unbelievers, uh, people with uh, problems, uh, family problems, dysfunction, uh, bankruptcies, uh, divorce cases, uh, addictions, uh, all this type of thing, okay? So they come into the church. We should not think that the church is all clean people, okay? The church is... I, I pose to you, we should not be frustrated when these things happen because I put to you a, a, a hopefully a more encouraging picture. The work of the Holy Spirit in the church is like a river. You have this beautiful river and then the, that's the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's cleaning, it's clean water. And then you bring all your clothes over there and then you're washing. There is enough water to, to clean. There's so much, you see, so abundant. You see that all your dirty clothes can come. All right, there's just so much. And then you clean and clean and then you put it over there and some continue to be dirty and the one that's longer in the water should be cleaner. But sometimes you have bad stains. Some stains are harder to clean. And then you have so many, so much water and then you just say, come, bring all your clothes in. And, and the Holy Spirit will make it as white as snow. 
So I think that maybe that would be a better picture. And then hopefully we say that, oh, come, come, come. Huh? You have divorces, it's okay. You have bankruptcies, does that mean that you cannot come near to God? You have porn addiction, gambling addiction, alcoholism, workaholism, you have whatever it is, come. Yeah, and I think that would be uh, what the Holy Spirit work in the church would be like. Yeah? Think of it as a river. So what is a church? So to, uh, to, uh, uh, today, we're talking about people uh, created, gathered, gifted, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So those are the three parts of the doctrine of the church. And then uh, the Trinity. And so we have God, the cross, and also uh, the people. Now, there is the function part. Okay, So that will come in in the next uh, two, uh, four sessions. We include about what does the church actually do. But today, we're talking about the basic identity. So... So I think the basic identity of the church must rest on the Trinity and our understanding of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I truly believe that if we all uh, reflect, think, ask, apply, whatever that we have learned today, hopefully, uh, then it will unite the church, Piazza uh, Baptist Church. So that is my, my hope, my prayer, actually, for this uh, series. Okay, so now we're going to do an exercise um, where I'll just gather questions. I don't think, what, we, what I'll try to do something different now is that throw as many questions as you can and then I will not answer, nobody will answer, but then uh, I'll put it up somewhere and then I'll put my answer and other people can answer it later on. So just think about this. As you think, you, you listen to all the various uh, uh, things that I've taught, uh, what are the questions that you have? I'm collecting questions, uh, harvesting questions. What are the questions you have? And then we'll record them down. And then uh, I'll answer. And, and others may try to answer. Again, we try to do it as a church together. We try to find out how we can uh, uh, wrestle with the, with the Bible together. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, let's just start. Okay, this is something that I do in, in, in my work as a lecturer. We, we just gather questions can be very fun. Oh, let me just explain also. Um, part of learning is simply to be able to ask questions. And I find that interesting questions lead to interesting insights, okay? So any question is fine. Uh, sometimes my children ask me very interesting questions as well. And then you find that um, the answers are not obvious. Huh? So um, any questions? Uh, just throw as many questions as you can. And then uh, that is how we will uh, do it. Lah. Mm. That, that's all for me.